adopted already for almost 15 years. So, but compared to many other colleagues, so you are really seniors to me all in this respect. So when I'm reading some paper about the decagonal quasi crystals, I, many times I find the following sentence. So the writer usually says, the decagonal quasi crystals, they are quasi -period periodic in a plane, but they are periodic crystals in the third dimension so that the influence of the quasi periodicity can be versus the periodicity can be studied on the same sample. Now, I was very much interested in, in this question. So are then the, uh, the decagonal quasi crystals, are they really 2D quasi crystals or we should consider them uh, two-dimensional only uh, from the crystallographic structure point of view and as a physical property system are they maybe three-dimensional? So that's the question which I would like to discuss here during this talk. For that we had to use first of all quasi crystals, decagonal quasi crystals which were single crystals and uh, we had to perform the measurements along different quasi uh, crystallographic directions both in the quasi periodic plane and in the periodic direction and moreover <coughs> we had also to make a lot of complementary experiments on the approximants of the decagonal phase and all together this gave quite I would say a comprehensive complete picture which I should like to present today now here. First just one slide regarding my institute staff currently 850 annual turnover this is in 2010 49 million euros and main fields of research are physics chemistry and biology there. So geometrical description of the decagonal phases it's like this there are two alternative descriptions one is the uh, to describe the structure as periodic stacking of quasi periodic atomic planes but there's another one which is not a two dimensional this is the packing of decagonal but in most cases people just pursue this description here which is a convenient description from the crystallographic point of view. Now it says like that there are quasi periodic atomic layers which are stacked periodically and uh, this is the tenfold periodic direction. I shall in all the experimental measurements which will be shown I shall, I shall designate the periodic direction with this capital letter P and in the decagonal approximants the same letter P will be used to show to indicate this to denote the direction which is the stacking direction here. So forgive my uh, sloppy wording, I will use the periodic direction for both the quasi crystals and decagonal approximants. In all cases it will be meant the stacking direction here. Now the stacked layer description of the decagonal phases it goes like that. There are phases with two atomic layers within one periodic unit of about 0.5 nanometers. This is decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel, aluminum cobalt copper. There are four layer structures, decagonal alum aluminum cobalt and aluminum nickel. Then six layer structures, aluminum manganese, aluminum palladium manganese and eight atomic layer structures, aluminum palladium, aluminum copper iron. Now this stacking uh, distances they are in fact quite regularly spaced in, in the units of about 0.4 nanometers and the same stacking distances they are found also in the decagonal approximant phases. Here I shall uh, show the following phases. This is the Y or Epsilon phase aluminum cobalt nickel which has two atomic layers within again about 0.4 nanometers. Then there are four atomic layer structures with this periodicity of 0.8 nanometers, it's orthorhombic aluminum 13 cobalt 4, monoclinic aluminum 13 cobalt, uh, sorry, iron 4, and that's a disordered variant of this one. It's monoclinic <coughs> aluminum 13 and then iron nickel 4, and in my presentation it will be a phase where 2% of nickel replaced the 2% iron. And uh, as a six atomic layer structure, I'm going to show this phase, this is aluminum 4, chromium, iron phase, the first described by Ding. Our investigated phases are the following. So the decagonal aluminum 
cobalt nickel was this composition, 70% aluminum, 10 cobalt, 20 nickel, so it's the nickel rich side of the decagonal uh, phase diagram. The Y phase, it was 76% aluminum, 22 cobalt, 2% 2 of nickel, 32 atoms in the giant unit cell, and B is the periodic direction. Then aluminum, 13 cobalt, 4 it was that composition, 102 atoms in the unit cell, and the periodic direction is A. Aluminum, 13, iron, 4, and iron, nickel, 4, it was this composition, 70. 6.5% of aluminum and 23 and a half iron and here 2% nickel replaced 2% of iron. The same unit cell, B is the, uh, the periodic direction and aluminum 4 chromium iron, this is the orthorhombic, 80% aluminum, 15 chromium, 15, uh, 5 iron and 306 atoms in the unit cell. That's already a giant unit cell intermetallic and A is the periodic direction here. Physical properties investigated, electrical resistivity, magnetic susceptibility, magnetization as a function of the field, thermoelectric power, Hall coefficient, thermal conductivity. In some cases we were able to calculate the electronic density of states and in some cases also the Fermi surface, which was essential then to do some ab initio calculations of these physical parameters. Uh, anisotropic physical measurements, they were performed in the following way. Two of the directions, they were always in plane, either in plane was the quasi-periodic plane or this atomic plane which is stacked periodically and the third one was along the tenfold direction. So the, for the orthorhombic phase the choice was trivial, so it was along the uh, crystallographic unit cell axis. For the monoclinic uh, symmetry, one was along the stacking direction, the other one was in the monoclinic plane, and the third one was this, it was perpendicular to the, uh, it was still in the monoclinic plane, but just perpendicular to this direction, so it is designated as A star. And for the decagonal phase, we perform measurements along the fivefold direction, sorry, tenfold direction, and there are then two inequivalent twofold axes in the quasi periodic plane, and they are lying at an angle of 18 degrees. But how we did the measurements, it's in fact in this way. So the type two of the uh, twofold axis, they are shown here by solid lines. There are 10 such axes, and the two prime type of the periodic, uh, I mean of the twofold axis, they are. Again, 10 in the quasi-periodic plane, but they lie at an angle of 18 degrees with respect to the neighboring twofold direction. So we performed the measurements along this one, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 direction, and this one. This is 2 prime, 1, 0, 1, minus 0, 0. Now, first of all, we wanted to see the decagonal quasi-crystals. Is it really a high-quality monocrystal if we accidentally, let's say, get that the properties within the, uh, the quasi-periodic plane would be the same. Is this a consequence just of uh, some bad crystal which would just have so much disorder that the decagonal order would be lost and we would have a kind of amorphous in-plane structure? So for that reason, we, s we determined the orientation-dependent NMR spectra of the aluminum 27. The spectrum is structured like that. This is so-called central transition in NMR, these are the satellite transitions, and if we rotate the crystal around a certain crystallographic axis, then this shape should change. And also the intensity at the given frequency should go up and down. So we try this one. This is for the tenfold rotation. We see that this is blown up spectrum, so the center line would go into the sky. The satellite transitions, we see there are some small variations with the angle. This is the twofold rotation. There is a bigger variation. Two prime rotation, again, bigger variation. But then we perform the following uh, measurements. So we were measuring the intensity of absorption of the NMR spectrum at a given frequency. And then we have plotted that in fine steps from 0 to 180 degrees. And we see this intensity 
it repeats only after 180 degrees. So that's a very nice two-fold symmetry. So this two-fold rotation axis, that's a well-defined axis. We see there's a mirror plane here, but this doesn't change the conclusion that there is a two-fold rotation axis, which and the crystal is very well ordered. This is two prime uh, rotation. This is again, you see the rotation pattern is slightly different, but again it repeats after 180 degrees. So the both two-fold axes are well defined. Now the most interesting is now the tenfold rotation. We see again the spectrum, so it doesn't change much, but if we study now in fine steps the intensity, this is at this new one frequency and new two, new one is here, new two is here. So we see that the pattern repeats every 36 degrees, but at 18 degrees there is not much difference. So it's almost like that we would say that it's a pseudo 20-fold symmetry, so in reality it's a 10-fold symmetry. But, uh, and that's at the frequency nu 2, we again see the pattern which repeats every 36 degrees, so that the crystals, they are fine, at least Structurally, we are working on a well-defined, on a well-grown, well-ordered decagonal quasi-crystal. Electrical resistivity. Now, here, from here on, I will many times show such slides where on the same panel it will be the same physical property of decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel, then of the approximants, aluminum 13 iron 4, epsilon aluminum cobalt nickel, and orthromic aluminum 13 cobalt 4. So the measurement along the periodic direction and along the two two-fold directions in the quasi-periodic plane, there is almost no anisotropy within the quasi-periodic plane and there's quite a large anisotropy to the periodic direction in the quasi-crystal. Now look at, let us look at the Y-phase approximant, aluminum, cobalt, nickel. Again, the resistivity along the stacking direction is lower, then the two resistivities in plane. The same result is obtained here for the aluminum 13 cobalt 4. Almost no anisotropy in plane and the smaller resistivity along the periodic direction. And aluminum 13 iron 4, it gives the same conclusion, except that we see here the resistivity for the lowest temperature of 2 Kelvin becomes very low. So we are obviously having a very well ordered crystals and the resistivity increases only by the phonons which are producing this inelastic electron phonon scattering. Now one of the answers, are we dealing with a two-dimensional or three-dimensional systems from the physical point of view? We see that the resistivity along the periodic direction is everywhere the lowest. So this is a very clear sign, these are, as a physical system, these are true three-dimensional systems. Now, there is a special concern we should take a look in this combination, aluminum 13 iron 4 and the one which has 2% of nickel, replacing 2% of iron. So, is there some, what is the change between these two? The NMR spectra show the following. The pure compound, aluminum 13 iron 4, shows sharp NMR absorption peaks this is for different orientations of the crystal axis with respect to the magnetic field. The one with the nickel, 2% nickel, it just shows very broad spectra. Most of the features are lost. And this just means that aluminum 13 iron 4, it can be observed or considered as a disordered version of the pure compound. So we are able here also to compare what is the influence of disorder on the quasi-crystalline phase. The disorder here is just it's a substitutional disorder, then it's a chemical disorder, and that one also then introduces some orientational disorder in the lattice. So let's compare these two phases, the ordered and disordered version for the electrical resistivity. If we look at the room temperature, we see that the resistivity values are practically the same of both systems. Here, the vertical scales are the same, horizontal scales are the same, and the resistivity values at 300 K, they are practically equal in both cases. However, going to zero temperature, we see there's a large residual resistivity for the disordered compound, and there is practically almost, the resistivity goes to very low values, like one 
micron centimeter for the ordered compound. So we can see here how much does the disorder influence the resistivity. Now in this way, disorder was introduced uh, in a controlled way by just replacing iron by nickel. But should we work on some, let's say, less high quality samples, we can have very nice effects which we would, we would be very excited. We found some effects which are nothing but just introduced by the disorder in the lattice. So high quality monocrystals, they are essential to determine the in, uh, intrinsic properties of the crystal. Now another conclusion which can be drawn by now uh, comparing the pure aluminum 13 iron 4, its disorder version and decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel. Here we see resistivity is almost temperature independent, whereas for the pure, pure compound it's strongly temperature dependent. Here the phonons can propagate, they produce this positive temperature coefficient resistivity, here they can't, phonons are suppressed by the disorder, almost temperature independent resistivity, and decagonal quasi crystals, almost temperature independent resistivity. So phonons are very much reduced in the decagonal quasi crystal. So phonons, they certainly do exist, long wavelength phonons, which they find the crystal, the, uh, the decagonal structure as an elastic continuum. They are still present, but otherwise, the phonon density of states should be low in the quasi-crystal. There are also some other types of electrical resistivity. This is the approximate aluminum for chromium iron. Here the resistivity shows such maxima. Again, it's the lowest along the periodic direction. But calculating the density of states at the Fermi level, it is high. This is not some low density of states, so we cannot say this is due to the pseudo get in the electronic density of states, but we have a non-metallic electrical resistivity in the presence of a high density of electrons, electron states. So all the theories which are in fact relating the pseudo get in the density of states <coughs> to the negative temperature coefficient, they should be carefully considered. So we made then a theory. It's a theory original by Trombley, de Lesardier and Fujiwara and then Trombley de Lesardier is the theory of slow charge carriers. What we did, we just introduced explicitly the temperature inside the theory. So we were able then to reproduce the temperature dependence resistivity uh, of the system with slow charge carriers. And slow charge carriers, it means that the electronic velocity is low. It just means the band dispersion is very low. So el uh, electrons are moving slowly. And in this case, there is a prediction that there is a transition from the ballistic type of motion. So where the electron in the naive picture goes, hits another either electron or ion and moves like that ballistically. So if the velocity is slow enough, then the motion becomes diffusive. And now for the diff diffusive type of motion, we are getting <coughs> such temperature dependencies like there's a maximum or negative temperature coefficient here. It can be like this also, or it can be, let's say, again, very broad maximum. But it's also in the ballistic limit, we are getting the normal positive temperature coefficient there. And then we compared the slow carriers, slow charge carrier theory to the exi existing one on the weak localization. And you can see this is now an example, it's aluminum palladium manganese. We could get the parameters where both theories gave exactly the same fits. Now, the weak point of the weak localization theory, this one is confined to low temperatures. These are quantum effects to the resistivity and they should normally be valid at low temperatures, whereas the slow charge carrier theory, it has no has no limitation in, in temperature. It can go from the lowest temperature up to the melting point there. Thermoelectric power. Here, this is decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel measured along tenfold axis, two prime and twofold mm -hmm. axis. And these are the other approximants here. So here we don't see any regularity in reality. And also, it can be like aluminum 13 cobalt nickel 4. Thermal power is negative along one crystallographic direction, zero along the other, 
positive around the third one. So that one again shows that we should be very careful when we study the thermal power of, of our systems. We should really be, be careful along which crystallographic direction we do that. We can say it's negative. Yes, that's true. But along one crystallographic direction, it's positive. Along another one, that's again true. Now, thermal power has one of the problems is that phonons are very much uh, affecting the thermal power. So that's why uh, it's not only the Fermi surface which would determine it, but also the phonons inside. And the interpretation of the thermal power is less straightforward than of the other transport properties. This is, for instance, thermal power of the pure compound aluminum 13 iron 4 and the one which is disordered with nickel. We see there are really not much resemblances, but we have seen in the resistivity that the resistivity of the pure compound, it has very strong temperature, positive temperature coefficient, whereas this one is almost temperature independence. So here we can't draw any conclusions which would unambiguously prove or or state some properties of quasi-crystals. This is, I just showed for comparison. So the closest compound in the thermal power to the decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel is this aluminum 4 chromium iron. So in both cases, thermal power is very small and shows some similar uh, <coughs> properties, but there is no good explanation of that. Hall coefficient. Hall coefficient in, is, in fact, the best property when we want to study the electronic properties of a solid. Because the Hall coefficient, first of all, it distinguishes between the electrons and holes. So it is sensitive whether we are in a p-type or n-type uh, regime of the electron charge carriers. And moreover, uh, the uh, Hall coefficient is somewhat less, uh, less dependent on the phonons. That's why Hall coefficient is, in fact, best quantity when we want to compare the physical properties of uh, our, let's say, quasi-crystal or approximants then to the, to the models which are then relying on the Fermi surface, which is calculated from the structural models. So in all cases, we are getting the following structure of the call coefficient. Now we can do, when we do this uh, dependence of the call coefficient on the orientation, we place the magnetic field along one direction and the current flows along the other per perpendicular or the third one, which is again perpendicular to the field. In this way, we can make six combinations of magnetic field and current directions. And we are then also, uh, we can, uh, we see the following structure. We always get three groups of two Hall coefficients where the magnetic field in one direction then results in the same Hall coefficient for the current in the other two perpendicular directions. But this is OK, because this is just a consequence of the Onsager relations. So Onsager relations, they are already requiring that we have such a structure. This is, however, another, uh, another um, point where we can check whether our crystals are structurally well grown or they would be some bad <coughs> crystals. So if the Onsager relations are well respected or if they are obtained experimentally, that we can be sure we are working on a good kind of a material. Now this is the aluminum cobalt nickel, the Y phase. So we had the whole coefficient which is positive for practically all six combination of the magnetic field and current directions. The combinations of the current and field directions are always at the top. A similar situation is obtained for orthorhombic aluminum 13 cobalt 4. However, here, two combinations, they give a positive Hall coefficient. This is close to zero. And we have also negative Hall coefficient. So it's obviously that the Fermi surface contains pockets of electrons and holes. So both are existing at the same time. The cagonal aluminum cobalt nickel, this is we are getting when the magnetic field is placed anywhere in the quasi-periodic plane. This is along two or two prime axis. We are getting always the same positive Hall coefficient. So if we direct the magnetic field along the tenfold direction, then the Hall coefficient becomes negative. It's again a rather 
tricky situation. So the same crystal, it's a p-type for some direction and it's an n-type, it's a electron or hole type in different crystallographic directions. This is again how much the hole coefficient is sensitive to the small change of the composition, 2% nickel compound uh, against the pure compound. We see that there is in fact really not, not much resemblance. So even a small change of the element inside, it can change quite drastically the physical properties. This is the hole coefficient of aluminum chromi uh, for chromium <coughs> iron approximant. Again, positive for some directions and negative for the other ones. Then we had a quite, a, I think, lucky situation that this epsilon phase <coughs> aluminum cobalt nickel, it contains only 32 atoms in the unit cell. So that's okay for ab initio calculations. We went into the model by Walter Steurer and then we calculated the Fermi surface ab initio. We took the model as published and then in the second step <coughs> we also relaxed it. Relaxation, uh, structural relaxation, theoretically it just means we are shifting the atoms for small distances, usually of the order of less than one-tenth of an angstrom even. And even that is enough that the forces on the atoms, they become much lower, which means the crystal is in the thermal equilibrium, at least theoretically. So then we produced, we calculated in the second step after the Fermi surfaces were known. By the way, here a Fermi surface, it contains 11 branches even, so a lot. And some of them are hole-like, the others are electron-like. Then we calculated ab initio the hole coefficient. This is exper experiment. This is the relaxed model, which matches quite well the experiment and even quantitatively, you can see that the numbers, this axis is the same for all. Original model, the agreement is qualitatively correct, but quantitatively it is not. So even such small shifts of the atoms by less than one-tenth of an angstrom, they can already influence uh, quite significantly the <coughs> uh, whole coefficient. Thermal conductivity, decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel, <coughs> relatively high conductivity along the tenfold direction and no dispersion in the quasi-periodic plane. Now similar results are obtained here. Y-phase aluminum cobalt nickel, this is two in-plane conductivities, this is the, per the stacking direction conductivity, the same here, the same here. So again these systems, they are the best uh, conductors for both electricity and heat along the periodic direction. Again, this is in favor of this statement that these are true three-dimensional solids. Now, how does the influence or the introduction of 2% of nickel, so with other words, of disorder, in the, introducing disorder into the, comp into the pure compound, how does it change the thermal conductivity? This is again the same scale here vertical, here and here. We see that the disorder reduces the thermal conductivity quite significantly by a factor of four here. This is the thermal conductivity aluminum for chromium iron. Here there is less dispersion, but the periodic direction is still the most thermally conducting one. This is now phononic contribution. And this is just assuming that uh, the wiedemann franz law is valid. That law is valid only in the case of uh, predominant elastic electron phonon scattering. So for those compounds where the residual resistivity at temperature zero is high, then the wiedemann franz law is a good approximation. And so for that reason, it doesn't work for the aluminum uh, 13 iron four where the residual resistivity is almost zero. But what we can see here, so after subtracting the electronic part from the total thermal conductivity, phononic part, so here, here, and here, it has almost no anisotropy. And this is again not strange because if only long wavelengths acoustic phonons can propagate, they find the crystal lattice as an elastic continuum and there is no reason why there should be some orientation dependence. So this shows or at least it gives a good hint that it's really the long wavelengths phonons which can propagate into the lattice, but short wavelengths, they are absent. Now, here, this one, 
seems to be a little different. At least there is higher dispersion or higher uh, anisotropy between the different crystalline directions. So this, what I said, seems to be quite generally true, but with some exceptions here. Now we then try to also to uh, calculate all the transport properties ab initio for the orthorhombic aluminum certain, certain cobalt-4 using the model by Yuri Green. And we calculated the Fermi surface. That's for the original model from this publication. And there's a new model, which has been so far referred many times. And many people are using it, but it still has not been published. We are always referring to some abstract of the Nuremberg Conference. So Yuri Green, he's kindly asked to, to make the publication, but I think that this will come out soon. Just we are already showing the uh, Fermi surface of the new model, so you can only get the model by asking somebody of people working with, with it, like me or Yuri Green, and you will get the coordinates, but paper still needs to be written. So here, the Fermi surface contains eight branches here. Now we tried ab initio the electrical resistivity. This is in a temperature uh, dependent way, but we can only produce this product, resistivity times the relaxation time. This is it's all uh, calculated in the Boltzmann transport theory. So what we get here is that we are getting the right order of anisotropy. This is periodic A axis. These are two in-plane directions, so we get the same here. And the models, they are, let's say, qualitatively, they go give good uh, matching to the theory. Thermal power, it fails. There is not much, much agreement between the theory and experiment. Hall coefficient doesn't look too bad, but only if we don't observe the vertical axis, because the numbers are by a factor of around three or two or two, three wrong compared to the experiment. So we are, in fact, not completely sure is the Boltzmann theory inadequate, is the structural model still to be refined. In any case, we are getting a good qualitative agreement, but not good quantitative agreement. Now, as the last thing, I would like to show the magnetization versus, uh, or magnetic properties of those compounds. Astonishingly, the cagonal aluminum cobalt nickel it is diamagnetic for all three directions. So placing magnetic field along the 10 volt axis or two or two prime axis, we are getting always negative sloping line is then in this M versus H plots. So this is a diamagnet in all three di di uh, crystallographic directions. Just it is less diamagnetic in the, for the magnetic field in the quasi-crystalline plane. The situation for uh, the uh, epsilon aluminum cobalt nickel is somewhat similar, diamagnet along the periodic direction, and we can, let's say, almost not neither paramagnetic nor diamagnetic, but it's a very small paramagnetic slope here, and again, no dispersion in the, for the two in-plane directions. This is aluminum for chromium iron. This is, again, this is paramagnetic all three directions, but no anisotropy in the, for the two in-play directions. And uh, orthorhombic aluminum 13 cobalt 4, again, uh, paramagnetic in all three directions, almost no anisotropy for the magnetic field along the in-play directions. Susceptibility, it shows similar uh, things. I should like, just like to mention that whatever we do, no matter how pure crystal we grow, there is always some residual imperfections there inside. So you see, this is the difference between the, between the zero field cooled and field cooled susceptibilities. At low temperatures, it comes out. We are not sure. Is that maybe some surface oxides, which we polish them away, they will reappear almost instantane instantaneously at the air atmosphere. Or there may be some uh, maybe cracks inside and at such positions like cracks or voids, though we don't see them in fact, but it may be some small 
clusters of material which is definitely not this phase or this phase or this phase, but it should be something maybe cobalt oxide or some cobalt rich regions here and here. They are always existing. They are small, they don't uh, spoil or they, they don't mask the magnetic properties of the phase, but they are ever present. This is the difference between the pure aluminum 13 iron 4 and the one with 2% nickel. We see that just the magnetism goes down in the disorder compound here. This is in short some of our papers where all those data are already published except for the decagonal aluminum cobalt nickel which we are still working on. And as a conclusion I would say magnetic electrical thermal transport properties of the cogonol, quasi-crystal and the approximants, they are highly anisotropic. <coughs> Stacking direction is the most conducting direction for both electricity and heat. Origin of the anisotropy, this is the stack layer atomic structure and I don't dare to say that it has something to do with the quasi-periodicity. It's more this uh, kind of an anisotropic stack layer structure. There is a good analogy between the Kagenol quasi crystal and its approximants, and from the physical properties point of view, the Kagenol quasi crystals and approximants are true three dimensional solids, cooperation, just group leaders. This is my colleagues in Ljubljana, Slovenia, Anna Smontara and her group in Zagreb, and the crystals which we were using, they were all grown by Birgitta Bauer and Peter Gille, so they did an excellent job, and I think I owe to our colleagues in Germany a lot because they supplied so good crystals that I'm sometimes saying as a joke, it is easy to win in a race if somebody gives you a, a Ferrari. So if they produce such good crystals, then it's, it's easy to do good physics. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>